every year. And the Queer Corazones is a community group. Everyone, anyone is welcome. Um, the Queer Corazones began in 2016, and we just try to create LGBTQ programming um, and also um, organizing around LGBTQ issues. So next slide, please. Well, could you exit out of it and then restart it? Because I added a slide, that's probably why. Or it's missing, it doesn't matter. So just some more information on the Queer Corazones. We meet every first Tuesday of the month. So if you're interested in coming, our next meeting, I believe is September 3rd, and we always meet here at 6 p.m. So if you're interested, please come by. We'll go pretty quick now. So um, on the screen behind me is for our, our monthly uh, our monthly concert called Noche Azul, and it's always the, pretty much the third Saturday of every month. And um, this month theme is Africana Latina, and so uh, admission is seven dollars más o menos. If you can um, pay seven dollars, uh, but if you cannot, we will not turn anyone away. And we also serve concessions at all of our concerts. Um, how many of you have heard of Las Tesoros? They De San Antonio, not too many, but you are hearing about them now, and so they are very, they're very um, important women who are from the west side of San Antonio, and they're singers, and there used to be four in their group, but um, as time has passed, we have um, two have passed away, and so the remaining two are Blanca and uh, Beatriz, and they will be playing at the Pearl August 30th. 6.30 and it's free and they will be accompanied with Azul and Eva Ibarra. Mi Barrio No Se Vende. How many of you have, have seen signs around San Antonio in people's yards saying Mi Barrio No Se Vende? A few of you? Well, you can get those signs here at the Esperanza. They're by donation and we encourage you to get them, put them in your lawn. If you don't have a lawn, put them in your window, if you're in an apartment. But it's a, it's a campaign that we're doing um, to try to stop gentrification. And especially on the west side, I don't know if many of you all know, but the Alazan Apache courts are scheduled to be demolished. And also, I don't know if you all know the west side Esperanza location, but there's a big open field across from our location. So they're going to be building um, high-rise apartments that aren't affordable for um, the majority of San Antonio. Um, and so it's just a really important issue to get involved in. We have cafecitos, little meetings, on every second and fourth Wednesday at our West Side location, which is 816 South Colorado Street. If you have any questions, again, you can ask me or any of the staff here. We're all wearing these little name tags. Next slide. All right, so we're going to be starting a new museum, a Museo del West Side, um, at our West Side location. And so if you all have um, any artifacts or photos or oral histories pertaining to the West Side, um, please let us know. Um, we have a, a, a staff member here, Sarah Gould, who is um, kicking off this. She's the one mainly facilitating the new museo. And next slide. Uh, there's also another um, exhibit that's going to be in 2020, so women and activism on the west side. So all west side, but the first one is going to be in the fall, um, and this one's going to be in 2020. So if you have any um, uh, photos, oral histories um, that we can document, please let us know. Next slide. All right, so we have Lermas. Uh, how many of you have heard of Lermas? It's on the west side. It's the historical Conjunto Club, and the Esperanza uh, a few years ago helped to save it from being demolished. It is a historical landmark, and so we just started construction this summer to restore it, and it's going to be another community space just like this one, um, is the Esperanza. So um, we're going to have music there, um, hoping to have a library. And so if you're interested, want to get more involved, we are trying to raise some money to uh, finish that project. And how many of you have heard of our peace market? More hands. Yes, yeah, so this year we're having the 30th 
annual Peace Market. It's a three-day market, indoors and outdoors. It's always the weekend after Thanksgiving. So if you miss one year, you can always come the next year. We invite international and local vendors to sell their handcrafted goods. And it's our alternative to Black Friday. So um, we have music, we have shut down the streets, we have a stage in the street, we have vendors in the street, and we serve food all day, and we listen to music all day, and it's just a really fun time. So if you all can come, please do. And if you all want to donate any food, um, or you have a good relationship with a restaurant you frequent all the time, and you think they might want to donate some food to us, um, we would really appreciate that because we do serve food to the community throughout all three days. And then um, I want to thank the volunteers today so, so much because we got so many volunteers and they were so needed and they made today just flow so easily. And um, so if you're a volunteer, you may already be standing, but please stand if you're not. I'm sorry, I just don't see you. Downstairs too, they're guarding over our resource tables and also um, making sure we're safe outside. Um, next slide. And then just another reminder to please recycle. Uh, if you have any paper or cans or glass, we do have blue recycling bins near the restrooms. And then the last slide, I want to invite um, Rachel Jennings to the podium. She is a board member of the Esperanza. And she's just going to talk a little bit about, um, she's going to introduce herself, but you know, why does she support the Esperanza, why she's a board member. And so please welcome Rachel Jennings. to, again, uh, pass out envelopes if any of you 
would like to make a donation. Thank you. Yes, so if any of y'all have any questions about how you can support the Esperanza, you can always ask me or any of the other staff. And then now we're going to get the program started. I'm going to invite Lauren Ferris, our moderator, uh, a queer corazón, um, my friend, to the stage. Thank you very much, Natalie. Natalie was actually an intern when, um, when Queer Cortezones got its start, and we were both there at the meeting, the very first meeting of Queer Cortezones. This is amazing. Um, the Esperanza Center is um, a place I very much love. It is the very first place on earth that I truly felt like I could be there and just be me and be safe. So, if you can donate to Esperanza, I strongly encourage it. But let me start out by saying that over the next couple of weeks, a lot of kids are going to be headed back to school, and it's a difficult time to start school um, or to be in school. Preschool, any part of school is, a, is difficult. When you're trans, it's sometimes almost impossible. We work with a lot of school districts, and, and we see a lot of things. I'd like to tell you um, one of something that's very exciting to us. We're encouraging more and more school districts to be active, to be fully inclusive, to live into full inclusion, to change policies if they can, but more than fighting for policies, we're, we're fighting for support affirmation and love for every child. That's what we believe is important. And that's why I hope you're here tonight. I want to begin by saying that a lot of organizations really work hard to put this on. Two of them are the Transgender Education Network of Texas, which I'm a part of. And the organization that helped make TENT, we call Transgender Education Network of Texas TENT, and the organization that helped make TENT what it is today, both financially and emotional support and a lot of other things, the ACLU of Texas. In, in 2017, I was in charge um, for, ten, for the um, um, Trans Lobby Day in Austin. And I'd taken over kind of late, and um, so I called um, someone, someone put me in touch with um, a gentleman at the ACLU, and I said, help, I really need help. And he said, Lauren, whatever you need, we're going to get through this, and, and we'll make it an amazing event. And it was an amazing event. And we, and he worked every moment of the 2017 and the 2019, but with me personally in 2017 in making that a very successful um, a legislative session for fighting against the things that might hurt us. Without further ado, I'd like to um, invite up here to speak from the ACLU of Texas, Brad, Bridget, and my friend. students and parents 
uh, the rights of students in schools because there's a misconception sometimes that your civil liberties and your free speech ends when you walk into a public school. And that is not the case. So, we can go to the next slide. So just a couple of things we wanted to be really clear about here when students are transitioning in school. Uh, your gender expression is protected. It is protected by the Constitution and by Title IX. Uh, and recently, Gavin Grimm just won his case. I don't know if you know That was an case. Uh, and it just further reinforces the fact that your gender expression and your gender identity are protected under the Constitution and of Title IX. Um, the second thing is, you're, you have a right to be yourself, and that includes the right to transition. Uh, so schools, there are a lot of obstacles that you have to deal with, including restroom access, locker room access, uh, name, pronouns, uh, what, how elected officials are going to classify you in records, uh, but you have the outcome. Uh, we don't have specifically clear guidelines yet on that, uh, but most schools are working to accommodate students when they transition, and if they aren't, you can contact us and we will help to hopefully write the course a little bit. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a really good resource, Gender Spectrum. So it's genderspectrum.org. Uh, and they have some really good resources on it, including a gender transition plan. So if your student is planning to transition while at school, uh, we would talk, to, we would basically recommend you talk to your counselor and possibly take a copy of this particular document as a plan that the two of you can work through together. Um, and that way the administration is being involved early on and you're gonna be able to get more support, hopefully, uh, if you're coming in really prepared to have the discussion. Next slide. Um, I forgot to say it. My pronouns are he and his. Uh, and those are my pronouns. They're not my preferred pronouns. No one's pronouns are preferred. They're just your pronouns. Um, so that's one of the things that I think schools sometimes have a hard time with is using proper pronouns. So when schools are refusing to acknowledge a student's gender identity uh, by not updating their school records, by not updating their name and attendance sheets, or student IDs or the yearbook, um, or associating the name with pronouns that actually reflect who they are, and we know that that can be really impactful in a negative way on students and can affect academic performance as well as uh, can be emotionally upsetting, it can be psychologically damaging. So we want to ensure that folks understand that pronouns are an important part of this. Your pronouns are your pronouns, they are not preferred. Um, your name is your name, it is how you should be addressed. So discrimination against trans students in that way does violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, Title IX. Uh, so if it's happening, we need to know it's happening. Um, and usually if you're, depending on the school district that you're in, you may be able to have an easier time of getting folks to accept that. Um, but we are in Texas, so the odds are good that you're going to run into folks who are not too happy about being accommodating to trans or LGBT students in general. Next slide. So bathroom placard signs, everybody's favorite piece of artwork. Um, so schools have a really important role in playing in making sure that students have the same access to the same opportunities, right? Um, and when and that means a safe environment for learning, it also means um, full participation in the activities of the school. Uh, so when we have students who are transitioning and they're being told they have to use separate facilities, um, that's sending a message that they're unfit to be on the same level as all the other students, right? Uh, so most of the experts agree that trans kids who are discriminated against in that way are going to suffer academically, socially, um, and are at a higher risk of depression. So this is a public health situation as well, right? It's not just about students' pronouns or the name that they want to be called by. This is a public health situation, and it's an educational situation. So that's why it's really important for trans kids to have access to the bathroom that is in accordance with their gender identity. We all know what bathroom we need to use, so we should just respect that. Next slide, please. So freedom of speech, you have that everywhere you go, including on public school campuses. Uh, the only time at school that you don't have free speech or when your free speech might be limited uh, is if your free speech is disruptive to course material or learning material. And what I mean by that is if Alex and I are having a conversation at lunch and we're talking about my gender identity, that's not disruptive. I'm allowed to do that. If we're sitting in a classroom learning math and I jump up in the back of the room and scream, I'm gay, disruptive. Uh, so one is disruptive, one is not, right? And your speech isn't restricted. Disruptive speech isn't speech that somebody doesn't like. It's disruptive. And there are clear definitions of what constitutes disruptive. Uh, and just talking about gender identity or LGBTQ issues is not specifically disruptive. Uh, so if somebody doesn't like your speech, that doesn't mean it's disruptive. It just means they don't like it. And I'm sure somebody's you'll just like somebody else's speech at some point as well. Um, the other thing I do want to add is you can 
You can write as a student or talk about LGBTQ issues in the content if it's relevant to an assignment. So if you're asked to do a history paper on a hero of yours and you choose Marsha P. Johnson uh, or Sylvia Rivera, you're allowed to do that. And the teacher can't say you can't pick those people. It's not just relevant content. Next slide. So your freedom of expression includes how you dress. Uh, does anybody have, does anyone, everyone know what I mean when I say a gender stereotype clothing, clothing that's gender stereotype? Can somebody give me an example? A gender clothing? A dress, right. So, um, just because, so, yeah. Um, if your school's dress code says that you have to dress a specific way or uniforms, that's a different story. But just because you're wearing something that might be considered controversial doesn't mean it's not allowed. As long as it's something that any person could actually wear at school. So it's your right to free expression extends to your gender clothing as well. So you can, if anyone in your school can wear a skirt and you identify as a boy and you want to wear a skirt, you're allowed to do that. Um, if anyone in your school can wear a tuxedo and you're, you identify as a girl and you want to wear a tuxedo, you can do that. Um, it's, as long as the clothing that you're wearing is allowed by anyone in the school, it's allowed to be worn by everyone in the school. You'll get pushback on it, absolutely, in certain school districts, but that's what we're there for. Um, the thing that school districts can do and that courts have said that school districts can do is they can use dress codes to instill discipline. Um, and typically what that's going to mean is they might have a dress code that includes things like your hair length or might specifically say, you know, a skirt has to be at a certain inches away from the knee or the ankle. Um, but beyond that, they can't tell you specifically you cannot wear gender clothing. So next slide. The other thing that you have access to as a student is you have a right to privacy. Um, so you have a right to be out at school. So if you choose to be out, you have that right to do that at school. You can discuss your life and who you are at school. Uh, the other thing that you, if you choose not to be out, or even if you're out of school, the school doesn't have a right to out you to anyone. So if you are a student and your parents don't know that you're LGBTQ, but your counselor does, your counselor cannot call, should not call your parents and have that discussion with them. That's a right to privacy that we all have, including students when we're at school. So we always encourage folks to, um, especially LGBTQ folks, but students in general, um, should know what the school's bullying and anti-harassment policies are. Um, some have really, really good policies, some have non-existent policies, uh, but we, we do want people to understand how bullying is dealt with in your school and what the recourse you have as a student is if you can So the way you can do that is Google, right? So if we can go two slides, please. You can go to Google, and you can Google something like San Antonio ISD, uh, forward policy, non-discrimination policy, LGBTQ policy. Uh, next slide. What that'll bring you is to a school district's website, and then you can navigate the website to find out what the board policy is. On the next slide, we'll kind of get an idea of what happens in San Antonio um, for its policy. The next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so some school districts have policies that are extended to uh, gender identity expression and sexual orientation. Uh, some have policies that are that may be less inclusive, maybe they haven't been updated in a long time. Uh, but most schools will have a policy in place for how to deal with bullying. Uh, and if your school administration or your ISD doesn't have a non-discrimination policy on the books, talk to us as well. Maybe we can help change that. Next slide, please. So this is an online resource that the ACLU built in conjunction with Kent and Equality Texas. Uh, this is txtranskids.org, and this is an online hub that's designed to basically be a one-stop shop for questions people may have uh, about kids transitioning in schools or what their rights may be. Uh, so we really are promoting that. We have cards downstairs if you need them. Uh, if you want to distribute them to folks who may need them, by all means, take as many as you want. Uh, but it's a really important resource, and up until two years ago, probably, there was nothing really that was a, a, a clearinghouse with this type of information. We really encourage folks to look into it. It'll tell you things about how to create a GSA at your school, uh, dress code information that we just kind of covered, access to facilities like locker and restrooms, uh, and bullying and harassment policies. So, next. <laughs> so this is the big one. Um, if you think your rights have already been violated at school, um, number one, we want you to keep calm about it and we want you to document everything. So we need you to stay as calm as possible. 
Um, and remember that throughout that process, you have rights as a student because your rights are protected by the Constitution and Title IX. Uh, we don't want you to dis disobey or resist the faculty or the staff if they're telling you to do something. Um, we want to start documenting everything immediately. We want to know who you were talking to, who was talking to you, who was in specific meetings, what you were told to do. If you can get things in writing, that's always useful. Uh, and then make a formal complaint, and then if you need more force behind it, you can contact the ACLU. And our website is aclutx.org. Uh, next slide. Or you can contact me. Uh, this is my email up on the screen right now. And um, also our social channels are on there, and you can always tweet at us or um, tag us on Instagram uh, if you're trying to get information to us. So that's all I have, it's really brief. Um, but if you need more information, again, you can email me, you can go to aclutx.org, you can go to txtranskids.org, um, and I'll be sitting around for the rest of the night, and if you have other questions, just come talk to me. Thank you. So everyone knows, we're going to have um, an extended question and answer period at the end, so if you could hold your questions, and Brad will be back up here. Everyone except, and if he wants to stay, that would be wonderful. Everyone except Councilman Trevino, I think, will be back up here to answer questions. And I'm not putting him on the spot. But, but I want to um, use that as a segue to the fact that um, you are all sit currently sitting in San Antonio City Council District 1. And um, it's a pretty amazing district. And um, it includes most of downtown, s several other parts. And one of the people that supports our community the most is our city councilman. Tonight, um, we have 100 backpacks that will be available downstairs um, right afterward. And those were provided by the, our city council office. And at this time, I'd like to invite up here and introduce you to um, my city council person, um, and but more, I think my friend and someone who's helped me and our community a great deal, Roberto Travigna.
So every year, we always have someone representing school districts, representing the schools, speak. Um, this year, um, we I would like to, to welcome up here someone that I know personally, someone that I have, she's been to the presentations we do, our tent trainings. She has also um, invited us to speak in her class. She teaches at um, Trinity University. She is, she attended Sam Houston um, State University and Texas Tech University. She has practiced school psychology in Illinois, New Mexico, and Texas. She currently works as a supervisor in Northside ISD's um, psychology, psychology services department. And aside from her passion for her profession, she is also an ardent soccer fan and referee and a mother of two toddlers, one of which we um, are happy to have here with us this evening. Um, and she enjoys staying constantly busy. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Laura Rankin from NISD.
evidence-based practices regarding how do we treat this population. And so what we have to do is we have to rely on, well, this worked over here, so let me try it here. You know, and kind of a try and try and try and hopefully we can find something that works. And, and especially in the schools, psychologists don't like that approach. We like evidence, we like data, we like numbers. It's like show us something that has been proven to work because especially say you work in a high school setting, I only have four years with a student. You know, I don't have time to try and fail and try and fail. It's not going to work. Um, but like we said, when you're when you're thinking about going out and voting and researching candidates, that can be something that's on your radar as well. It's not always the big ticket items like the bathroom bills and things like that. We also need to think but in terms of what you can do for your students now, that are going into schools this year, all over San Antonio, um, I should have probably started with the disclaimer that I am in no way acting as a Northside uh, spokesperson today. The views expressed are my own and not those of Northside ISD. I think that's the statement I was supposed to read. Uh, something along those lines, you get the picture. However, what we're trying to do, at least in Northside, and that's where I can speak to, is we're trying to get out the word that kind of knowledge is the first step, right? We would hope for universal acceptance. Northside is a huge district. We have 180 campuses with more being added every year. In my own department, we have about 100 school psychologists that are spread throughout the district. And so we're starting in our department, we're doing the safe zone training. We're calling in Lauren and other experts in this area to teach us what we need to know. Because a lot of people, if you say, oh, well, you know, do you, are you accepting of everyone? Oh, yeah, sure. You know, we teach everyone. We don't care. Black, green, yellow, whatever. We take, and that's not enough. You know, it's not enough to just say, yes, I'm accepting of everybody. Because there's a difference between tolerance and acceptance. You know, you can say, I tolerate this, but you, there are some people that you get the gist of what's behind them. Yes, I'll tolerate you. It's not the same as I accept you for who you are and that you are welcome in our school. And so we tr really try to get that message out there that it's not just about being tolerant. You know, you have to take that extra step. So some of the things that we recommend for our school psychologists are like the GSA. You know, we're not faculty, but if that club needs a sponsor, go do it. You know, if the GSA is having a bake sale, go buy a brownie. You know you want one anyway. You know, buy an extra one take them home. Support the students. We had a student that came to our school, and I worked at one of the high schools in our district, and all of a sudden one day I got a teacher running in, and they said, Laura, there's a girl trying to register, and it's not a girl, it's a boy. What do we do? And in my mind, I'm like, is the registrar not here? Get them the registration pack. You know, what, what's the problem here? And they said, well, no, what do we do? I mean, would he, her, you know, like, you ask. You know, this might be your first experience with a person that identifies as transgender, and that's okay. If you don't know, ask. But I said, you, she told you she was a girl. Her name is Andrea or whatever, you know, but, so that's what you say. You know, that's what you write on the paper. And there are certain circumstances where that's not always, we can't act in the way we would like to. For example, our special ed records, we have to have a legal name, you know, and if the name hasn't been legally changed, then whatever name we have on file has to go on that report. But we give our people the tools to say, you can have the legal name at the top of the report, but you can put a little disclaimer in the first sentence that, you know, so-and-so identifies as female and her, her, her name is this, and that will be the name that's used throughout this report. You know, and the things with the bathrooms, maybe the school isn't as supportive as we would like as, you know, using the bathroom that that student's choosing. But we can make it clear to that student and their family that, hey guys, you know, we know this hasn't happened yet, but we're fighting for you. We talked to the principal. We wrote a letter to the superintendent. We're, we're working on it for you. And I had a student that came to me and I told him again, you know, hey, I'm sorry. I know this is a hassle for you. You're having to go to the nurse's office or use this other restroom. And she told me, you know what, miss, it's okay because I know even though you haven't done it, that you're trying and that means a lot. 
you know, so if we can't change the policy right now, we can at least make it clear that we're on your side and that we support you. So for your students, there is a small population that comes into the schools and they do have a diagnosis of gender dysphoria and parents will write letters saying, well, I want them evaluated for special education. I want to see if they can get some counseling in the schools. I want to see what there is that can be done for these students. Because from a recent survey, we know that these students need support. 85% of them reported being verbally harassed at school because of their gender identity. 50% report being physically harassed, just bumped or shoved into a locker or something of that nature. And 25% reported actually being physically assaulted. So harmed, punched, kicked, thrown down to the floor, used, you know, been the victim of someone with a weapon. 25% is a huge number. You know, it doesn't matter how many kids the whole population is, that is a huge number. And more so on the educational side of it, over half of students that identified as transgender said that they missed at least one week of school the previous year because they were scared to go for whatever reason. And so we know that that impacts them. It impacts them not only emotionally, but also physically. And so going to school and being afraid, being unsupported is not a situation that we want to put any of our students in at any time. If you have a student that is suffering with depression or anxiety in addition to identifying as transgender, there are some supports for you. Special education is an option. If you have a significant mood disorder or emotional need, there's a process that differs for every district. But something that we're also doing in Northside ISD, and you have to contact your district or your school to know if this is applicable in your district. But we are also offering what we call psych consult services. So typically services with a school psychologist are reserved for students in special ed that need significant help have been through the evaluation process. It's very lengthy. But on these psych consults, we can have a parent sign consent and say, I would like you to be a safe place for my student. I would like them to be able to come and see you once a week if they want to, or just on an as-needed basis so that we can be one extra person to support that student. And so check with your district, check with, check with your individual school, and see if that, that, if that might be an option for you or your student. Um, but that is all I have. Thank you all for coming. So, so much, Dr. Rankin. And she is with a district that she, her voice and the things she said and how supportive she is of our community is reflective of much of the administration of Northside ISD. Um, and when, there, when the bathroom bill was in Austin, there was one superintendent who was willing to stand up and say, I oppose this. And that was the superintendent of Northside ISD. And so th their policies are not inclusive, but they live into it as much more than many do. Dr. Rankin can be a great resource for you in the district if you need assistance um, or if you're having issues. Not every district in San Antonio is quite as um, inclusive, um, is quite as welcoming. Um, some have schools that do well, and you'll hear more about those this evening. But I encourage you, if you have specific questions about how can I help my child in school, Dr. Rankin will be here, and she will help answer some of those questions, as will um, the parents and others. At this time, he hates it when I say this, but I want to introduce you to my boss. Um, I want to introduce you to someone who, so the Transgender Education Network of Texas has been around a long time, but we were never truly recognized statewide as the organization that represented um, transgender community and organizations across the state. Um, and 
by HDLU and others, but now, thankfully, we all do have that recognition. And one of the people, probably the person that has the most to do with that, is the person I'd like to introduce you to now. He is the Executive Director of the Transgender Education Network of Texas, Emmett Shelley. Thank you so much, um, Lauren. She says I'm her boss, but really, don't mind. So, like Lauren said, my name is Evan Schelling. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I lead Tent, uh, which is Transgender Education Network of Texas. Uh, we're a statewide, trans-led, trans-focused uh, organization here uh, in the great state of Texas, and. We deal a lot with ledge, uh, which you heard a little bit about. I don't want to really dive into that too much and get too political, um, but I, I don't think it's a secret. Uh, uh, the way that our legislative body here in Texas is towards trans uh, identified individuals uh, and students, unfortunately. So a lot of our work centers around that uh, during uh, the odd number of years and uh, the rest of our work uh, is advocacy done through an educational lens. Uh, we work really hard um, to do this work through a racial justice lens uh, with an emphasis on uh, the, the many intersections uh, that make up uh, one individual. Uh, because uh, contrary to popular belief, uh, being trans is not the uh, only facet of uh, transgender people's uh, whole sum of, of who they are as people. Uh, so I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, what it's like to uh, be a trans man, uh, to, uh, in, in a large sense, sometimes we're an in, in, invisible population. Um, when the bathroom bill came around, one of the things that uh, I think shocked uh, the legislators uh, was when trans men started to visit their offices and uh, I, I don't, I'm Asian, so I don't personally have a beard, but uh, we, we brought in, you know, a lot of trans men from all over the state, and uh, when they walked in, they were like, you, you're, you're pushing this bathroom bill, but essentially what you're going to do is you're going to push me in the bathroom with your wife. Uh, so, how, you know, what does that mean? What's the implication? Uh, and it, it kind of did shine a light on, um, I think, the, the insidious motivation behind it, right? Uh, so trans masculine people, trans men, uh, because they are largely sort of like invisible in a lot of ways, because externally we don't face, uh, I think, the same level of violence that trans women do. I think it's very important for people to understand that. That's why we really center that, uh, why we push that like we need to stand with trans women, especially black trans women, especially Latinx trans women, trans women of color. Uh, because they are at a disproportionate um, rate for violence externally. However, when we're talking about trans men and trans masculine people, we are at a high, much higher rate of, uh, of violence uh, internally. Uh, in terms of suicide, uh, our rates are just, when, when people see the numbers, it's, it's uh, very sobering, it's very shocking. Um, but a lot of the issues uh, come from, you know, when trans men transition, uh, a lot of times we don't see role models. So for me personally, uh, the first like representation in the media that I saw of somebody that like whose story echoed mine. And I finally was like, I'm A, I'm not like just imagining this and I'm not alone. Uh, was Boys Don't Cry. So, if anybody has seen that movie, uh, it's a very jolting movie as a child to see that, to realize that your story connects someplace, and then to see where that story ends. You know, because that story was also based on a real life situation that happened. So, when we talk about like trans men, unfortunately we also need to talk about the, the role that we play in uh, sometimes bringing some like facets of toxic masculinity, of uh, misogyny, 
into trying to fit into this world uh, of how we're viewing it, how we feel like what makes somebody a man, right? And knowing who we are and knowing sometimes like fitting in, uh, it's not popular to say this, but fitting in is some, to some extent a degree of safety, right? And so seeing, uh, for me, seeing trans masculine people sort of mimic uh, these really unhealthy attitudes and behavior is really heartbreaking. And when I think about, you know, trans kids that are coming out, like young trans masculine folks coming out, uh, I, I really feel that responsibility, that weight, to hopefully be a better example. To hopefully be able for trans kids, like masculine and feminine, to look at and say, I can be successful, I can be okay, I can be safe. Because a lot of times, unfortunately, when we talk about our community, we're talking about like these doom and gloom things. And for a child who's already dealing with X, Y, Z because of who they are and they cannot help it, and then having a lack of positive representation, a representation uh, that, that is still unapologetically, like I, I'm a binary trans man, but like still, hopefully we're doing better. Um, my, my hope is always that the work that I do uh, will trickle down, will help uh, other trans kids uh, to see that like the world is not all these statistics, it's not all people that are against you, and it's changing in a good way, slowly. It's changing in a bad way sometimes. Uh, anybody that turns on the news knows that. Uh, but we're here and we're fighting, and you know, I, I, I have so much respect uh, for parents who listen to their kids. They believe their kids, because it's a hard thing. Um, when I came out uh, to my parents, I lost my parents, essentially. So that piece of having you know, your family, the people that um, are supposed to love you no matter what, they're supposed to always be there for you, abandon you, and essentially tell you, uh, you are not worthy, you are not loved, and you do not belong. And something is wrong with you. It, you know, that, the weight of when that happens, uh, I think is, is a trauma that, uh, it, it's very hard to wrap your head around. Um, which I think really ups the responsibility of uh, the work that, that we do. So I want to say thank you to everybody who came out, that's where I'm center, ACLU. Um, and, and for the parents that, that came with, with your kids, thank you. Uh, I often kind of look at, at parents um, who are supporting their kids and like fighting for them uh, so hard. And I think to myself, you know, in, in 20 years, things will be different. In 30 years, things will be different. Maybe they won't be all the way different before I like leave the earth, but I'm already seeing change. And a lot of it is, is thanks uh, to the sport, to love, and uh, the continued like quest uh, to educate ourselves, uh, to learn more, and to learn how we can be better uh, supportive for kids that uh, are trans and do face uh, many more risks than their cisgender counterparts. Thank you. So before we go further, I'd just like to kind of get a quick show of hands, and if you're not comfortable telling me, that's okay too. How many people do we have that work for schools in any capacity? Well, quite a few. How many, how many how about parents? How many people actually know a trans person? Okay, the rest of you, you're probably wrong. <laughs> You, you, probably, you probably do and just don't know you do. Or a trans child. You just, with a trans child, they're just children. One of the things that Dr. Rankin has taught me is not to talk about our trans children, but about our children, because they're just our children. Some of them just happen to be trans. Um, so I think it's really important that we have some place for youth to go, 
or youth to find a safe place. Several years ago, um, another parent and some other individuals, parent and that parent's child, um, decided that we needed a place that was a safe place for LGBTQ youth um, in San Antonio. And that organization does amazing work. That organization is called Fiesta Youth. And one of the things about this program is we have kids come up and speak with their parents sometimes as part of the panel. And this person spoke their, the year they got out of high school. And they were very young. And now, I'm not going to say they're much older, but they are older. Still young, but older. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to Leo from Fiesta U. Texas, uh, going to 
uh, a very conservative church. You know, not every Sunday, but periodically I went. And uh, the older I got, you know, I, my parents split up, and I went with my father. So, you know, going into middle school was already a sort of difficult time. You know, when you pile on, you know, puberty, uh, you're going to a new school, you know, parents are divorced, and you're starting to question who you are. You know, you're just starting to figure out your last from your rights. You're starting to question yourself, who you want to be, who you're going to be. And, uh, you know, that time alone is hard for anybody. And, uh, I, so, as I was saying earlier, I was raised in the mentality, boys are boys, girls are girls, you can't be both, you can't, you can only be one, and, you know, your, gen, your gender roles. And, uh, when I started middle school, you know, I started questioning it, and, you know, I started, all I knew back then, you were gay or you were straight. I had no idea about anything LGBT related other than you're gay or you're not. And so, sixth grade I started questioning. And I remember talking to one of my friends about it. And my dad, you know, being the cautious parent, would go through my phone every now and again. And he saw these uh, messages, me talking to my friend about it. And he sat me down and he told me, look, I don't care who you love, who you are. I'm going to love you no matter what, because you are my son, no matter what anybody else wants to say. And so, you know, I went throughout sixth grade, most of seventh grade, thinking, you know what, maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just gay, you know? By the time I hit seventh grade, I got to meet a couple more friends who actually introduced me to the LGBT community, you know. They explained to me that there's a whole spectrum, there's a whole group of people that, you know, identify separately than what they were assigned at birth, who love someone of the same sex, of the same gender, who will just love anybody because of who they are, and it doesn't matter what they what they had, you know. And uh, these times, as I said earlier, are confusing. But having people to go to certainly help. But it also, also with those people who I knew I could go to, I also ran into people who made me feel I wasn't wanted that who I was wasn't right. I dropped, I dropped out of a lot of groups that I was in because of those kinds of people. Because I felt, going to those groups, I felt as though I, I couldn't be who I was, that I had to fit a certain, I had to fit a certain description. I had to fit the ideal male, you know, and it was around this time when I started learning about what being transgender is, what being LGBT meant. I started learning, you know, the sexual orientations, gender identity, binary, non-binary. You know, I started to do all this research. And by the time I entered, you know, my eighth grade year, I was pretty sure that I was transgender, you know. I question. I was. I've been questioning at this point by almost two, two and a half years. And so, by the time I entered eighth grade, I met a friend. We'll call. We'll call Jay. You know, I met my friend Jay, and they introduced me to more, more things about the LGBT community that I never knew. And with their help, that's how I came up. It's being called. Taylor, how I think that's what really helps cement the idea that I am trans. 
you know. And also help because thanks to my friend Jay, I managed to tell my father I am trans. My dad told me when I came out to him. He says he may not be the best parent to talk to about it, that he might not know as much as he wants to, but he said none of it mattered as long as I was being safe and knew that I was doing what was right to me. And I know not everybody, not all children, not all teens, not all children have that same parent in their life. But, uh, you know, with that help, you know, I've managed to be more out, I've managed to be more open. You know, I've had my fair share of people, you know, being verbally assaulted in school hallways. I've been pushed down to the ground. I've been, you know, I've been through my fair share of bullying just for being me. But I tell myself there's going to be a day where I'll be able to walk the halls of my school, I'll be able to walk down my neighborhood, and I'll be able to feel comfortable in my own skin, in my own body, and I don't have to worry about someone coming up to me and telling me my way of life is wrong. I'll be able to walk down the street, live with whoever I want to live with, love whoever I do, and not be told that it's wrong. And, you know, there are going to be people who sad, sadly will oppose everything that we make strides. We make, every time we make strides, there's sadly going to be people who push back. But I know that with all this struggle going on with everything, you know, with people who push back, I always, I have faith that one day we're all going to push through the, through it all and make the changes that we know have to be made. And, you know, especially going to Fiesta Youth, my first time was this last Tuesday, and uh, I met, I met some people who I never thought I'd actually, I wouldn't, I don't like being in large groups, but being there was comforting. I felt at home as if I had a place to be myself. And I want to let everyone in here know that no matter who you are, no matter who you love, there's always a place, there's a place for everybody. There's a place where you can be yourself and not have to deal with the people who don't like who don't like what you stand for. You don't have to deal with the people who disagree with your way of life. You don't have to deal with people telling you your wrong. There's a place for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor, so much. That was such an inspiring story. Now is um, Sierra. We're going to give a little, much, uh, little story about what they experienced. Hi, uh, I'm Sierra, and I'm 16 years old. I'm going to be a junior at Keystone School. I came out as trans at school last year as a sophomore. And my mom and my dad, we went to the school counselor and we met with the principal and her, and the counselor, to talk about transitioning. And from there, the, the principal went and told the other teachers about what was going on in the situation. And I'm very fortunate that all my teachers were very accepting of it. They were very willing to help me throughout this process. So, however, sometimes a lot of the teachers I had had 
before and so I haven't known me since seventh grade. So some, some, sometimes I need to be reminded that, oh, they need to use these pronouns in this name. And if there was ever a problem, I could always go back to the school's principal and talk to them about that. I didn't have much of a problem with bullying because my school has a very strict policy on bullying because it's a pretty small school and they don't tolerate anything. With sports, for my school I had to have one sports credit to graduate and doing a sport like volleyball or soccer that was half a credit. So I was lucky that my freshman year I did do volleyball, which is an all girls sport at my school and I was now then so it was fine. And I just there was another sport, tennis, that was co-ed, so I did that and that finished off my credit completely. However, for changing in the locker rooms, I didn't change in the locker rooms because, well, I can't go with the girls because I'm, I'm not a girl. Um, but I was still a little scared to use the men's locker room, so I would go to one of the many gender-neutral bathrooms around campus and use that instead, which worked out pretty well, I think. I'm very fortunate to have my mom because she's helped me a lot through this process. She's helped me get counseling and she's working to get my name to gender market change. She's got me binders, looking for doctors and everything. So thanks to my mom. She's sitting in the back there. She's amazing. Yeah.
four years ago, and she had just come out, and she was really struggling in a Northside ISD school, but she's doing really well. In the school, schools are doing really well with her. So we have always invited her back for an update on how she's doing. This year, little Jazz doesn't want to be here. Jazz doesn't want to be here because Jazz just wants to be a kid. Just a kid. Not a trans kid. Just a kid. And so we completely understand that. But I want to give Jazz a round of applause. Even though she's not here. So now we're going to invite a panel to come up, a panel of mostly parents and, and another student and a parent and her son. And hopefully they will talk about the summer experience they got to have um, traveling, traveling as themselves, living with kids of their gender. What an amazing thing. So first, I'd like to introduce two amazing moms. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Ginger Chun, whose daughter is in Washington State. Ginger is somewhere. Ginger, we're waiting. Ginger is also a part of Trans Allies. So, Um, the next person I'm going to introduce um, had intended to have her husband and son come, but her oldest son was in a car accident today, and they had a that family emergency towed their car, and so she's here, um, but she didn't bring her family with her. Kimberly Anderson, who is also with Trans Allies. And I'm, now I would like to introduce Adam and his mom, come on up, and his mom, Christina. They are also the trans allies. So, so they're going to make me stand, right? No, Lauren. It's okay. I'm not going to go up. So, let me just ask each of you, Adam, we're going to start with you, okay? Just take um, just a moment, tell the people your name, where you go to school, and just a little about you, and then we'll start with some specific questions. Over to talk on the microphone, but um, my name is Ginger 
Chun, and my pronouns are she or hers. I have two children, a boy and a girl. I guess they probably don't want to be called boys and girls because they're uh, 19 and 16, but. My 19-year-old um, uh, daughter is transgender. She came out about three years ago in high school here in San Antonio. And it's been a journey, her journey, not my journey. I always have to tell myself that. Um, just along for the support. So, let me ask the three parents, how did your children come out to you? And how have you supported them? And how have you supported them in, with the schools? So, we'll start with Ginger. So my daughter was a little creative and not very clear when she came out to me the first time. And she, this was her freshman year of high school and she came to me one day when we were standing in the kitchen and said, Mom, next time I go to a dance, I wanna wear a dress. And anybody who knows my child, she's very pr provocative and she likes to make political statements and she's very, she's just very, I don't know how to exactly describe it, but just into being different. She's got a strong personality. And so I was like, sure, if you want to wear a dress, that's fine. But just make sure there isn't some kid that really needs to wear a dress. So I totally missed the boat. And I thought she was just trying to like support some friends or something, but really she was trying to tell me something about her, which I totally missed. And so it took her almost a year to come out again and say, hey, mom, I'm trans. So we had a whole, her whole freshman year where she had this thing inside her that she didn't tell me. And, um, or tell either of us, my husband or myself. And so then she did finally come and specifically say, hey mom, I'm trans. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, and I didn't know what to say because I didn't really know anything about it. That was right about when Caitlyn Jenner was coming out. And so that was my whole exposure to transgender <laughs> was Kate and Jen. And now I know so much. <laughs> and so I was just like, oh, okay. And, and was there anything else you wanted to tell me? And she was like, mm, not at the time. And my husband, of course, was out of town, because that's when your kids tell you big things. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I called him and I said, hey, um, our child's name came to me and told me this thing, and I shared that with him, and he was like, really? Uh, okay. And so that kind of started our journey, and it took us, I mean, obviously we found a, a therapist, because San Antonio's got some great therapists, and we just started learning and educating ourselves. Uh, we went to Fiesta Youth, I went to PFLAG, I just started doing different things to, to learn, and um, Luckily, uh, we had an amazing guidance counselor at our high school, and when we came to the guidance counselor and said, hey, uh, our child is transgender and she wants to come out of the school, this guidance counselor was amazing. And I was just talking to somebody earlier today about how it's really very interesting, your experiences, from talking to other parents, your experiences about coming out of the school. And we were, are in the Northeast School District, and uh, that school district is not known for being supportive, but we were just so lucky because we found the right person. And so our experience in school was that this guidance counselor advocated for us, and she got my child's teachers together, and we sat down with them before the school year started and talked about what was gonna happen, and it really ended up being a very amazing experience. And the interesting thing is that Kimberly's daughter went to high school with my daughter. And she did not even realize until graduation that my daughter had transitioned and was this, you know, going by a different name and any of that. She was like, oh my gosh. And so I feel that that's a testament to the school, that, the, that it wasn't a big deal. And that my child was able to transition and graduate and have a really decent high school experience with making it no big deal. But it was luck. And I'm sure Kimberly's going to share a slightly different story. Yeah, so, so we're going to segue to Kimberly and let Kimberly answer the same questions with perhaps a little bit different perspective. Yes, um, so um, my child, who is uh, transgender and 
gender identifies on the binary, and he identifies as a trans man. And um, I, a year, in fact, it's not even been a whole year. Um, it's been since August 27th um, is when I found out. A year ago, um, August 26th, we dropped our first child, well, the first child that we dropped off at school. And um, it is the, was the closest sibling that my child had at the time. And they were so close, and I was actually very concerned that seeing my child withdraw um, a lot during the summer, um, the doctors and I had some very, very real concerns about his mental health um, and how he was going to move forward without his sister there. And um, so the night that we, night before school started, um, I expressed to him that we neither needed to start taking the prescription that the doctor had given us for depression, or that we needed to figure out what was at the source of his depression and start speaking to somebody about it. And the next day was the first day of school. And he texted me about two minutes after I dropped him off. And he said, Mom, I left a note in your car when you read it. And I said, as soon as I get home, I will read it, because I was still driving at the time. And I read it, and then um, I was just shocked, um, which, which is silly looking back, because in, in school shopping, we were shopping for binders, and we shopped in the men's department. And so all of the things and all of the clues that were right in front of my face, I didn't have the language to process as what those were meaning at that time. Um, because I hadn't, it hadn't been normalized enough in my circles for me to understand what that meant. So looking back, I kind of feel silly, but um, I read that note, and in that note, it was incredible, his articulation of what he said, Mom, I am a transgender boy, and it is not a mental illness. I identify as a boy because that's the way I was born. I know that dad might have a hard time with this, and I know you still love me because you told me, but I still kind of want to go to church because sometimes I feel really comfortable there. Um, I, I hope that you guys still love me, and he said a few other things that had let me know that he had researched this quite a bit, that he had explained what transgender was. So, when I talked to my husband, we were both very much on the same page of this is our kid, we love him, we're gonna do everything we can to support and affirm him and figure out the next steps because there is nothing in the parenting books about how to go about this. So what do I do? And thankfully my husband's involved in social services and had some access to some resources and so we started almost immediately attending BSU Youth and PFLAG and trans allies meetings. And I began, my coping skill is to learn everything I can about the subject and to become a subject matter expert. So um, so, that's, uh, so that's what I proceeded to do. And, and I just uh, talked to Lauren recently about, we had decided at the time that we were going to, you know, allow him to transition to a certain point, but we were very sure that, you know, he needed to wait a little while, which led to, it shows you my ignorance of the journey that we were about to embark on as a family. Um, but I found out that he um, already had his teachers at school calling him Anderson for like six months. Um, so I was like, so are you out of school or are you not out of school? He's like, well, my teachers call me Anderson and I don't know, whatever that means, but just tell everybody. I said, wait, you want me to just tell everybody? He's like, yeah, just tell everybody. Get it all over with so I don't have to do it ever again. I was like, well, that's not really how this works. But I hear what you're saying, and we'll start to go forward with this. So um, we met with a really great therapist who was able to kind of help put all of our thoughts together and get us a, a great letter that I could take to school and have, um, have it kind of laid out what our expectations of the, of the transition would go and how they would go. And um, it was the first, that was the first time that he was gonna be coming out because um, he had won an award where his name would be called, his chosen name would be called. 
And so it was very important for me to get the school on board with it that day because I was like, all these kids are going to hear his chosen name for the first time. So really hope this works out. No. Um, the front desk people were amazing and really worked with me. And um, the administration was cautious, to say best term, <laughs> very cautious. His teachers had already, I had already been discussing with them. They already knew the situation and were very comfortable with calling him Anderson and whichever, whether he decided to go by Nathan in his time or not. But uh, we had, we came to the point where right before school was ending, we knew that we were going to get his name and gender marker changed this summer, which we did get his name and gender marker changed this summer. So thank you. That is great. about uh, what the process would be for the next year because being his grade level, um, he still has a requirement for PE. And I said, I want to make sure that my son is able to be in the correct PE class in locker room. And the administrator said, well, that might not look like what you think it's going to look like. And I was like, I'm sorry. You're going to force my son to go to the girls' locker room? She said, no. He can use the single-use restroom outside of the boy, outside of the locker rooms, which he'll have to wait for a coach to open up at the start of every PE class. And I was like, yeah, because that coach is going to be there on time, right? That is not going to happen. I said, and what's my other option? She said, well, or he could change in the nurse's office. Okay, he's going to change in the nurse's office? Yes, in their single-use restroom. Where is he going to leave his clothes? In the nurse's office. And then walk all the way to the gym. In his PE clothes? Yes, that's the other option. Okay, so we have him standing outside with all the other kids entering the locker room, waiting for a coach to open it up for him to go by himself into one place. Or we have him being humiliated by walking across the entire school in his PE uniform every day. Those are great options. She said, well, in speaking with our attorney, that's what they wanted me to present to you. And I said, thank you. I will speak with my attorney, and I will get back to you on what we will present to you. And then I did the hardest thing that I've ever had to do. And I asked my son what he wanted. Because it's his journey, not mine. And I knew that if I fought this, this fighting the giant of the school district that we're in, it's not going to be a quiet fight. Um, and there would be every chance that his name would be leaked. And I couldn't, and I asked him how he felt about that, and he said, I don't want that. I just want to just be, I'll, I'll, I'm fine with going into the nurse's office, because I don't want to be around the other boys, because they'll kick, well, he didn't say a nice word, but, but he was really afraid for his safety. Um, so, it took a long time for me to process that, and I really worked at finding alternative options for him to take PE, and that's not been an option. And so, after much thought and discussion amongst our family, I'm respecting his wishes and allowing him to change in the nurse's office for now, until to a different place and then I will fight for him as much as he wants to. But I I think that this isn't this isn't uh, this is the norm. Uh, he doesn't want to rock the boat. He doesn't want to be noticed. He wants to just be like every other kid. And I can't give that to him without fighting and making him not like every other kid. So I wish that I could. Um, but we're just going to have to wait until his voice gets a little bigger, and hopefully um, he lets me know when that happens. So. Are you comfortable sharing what school district? We're in the Northeast School District. Is that anything anybody was surprised? So, Christina? So, when um, Adam came out to us, it was like the end of his freshman year. And he said his name, and um, he 
he let us know that that's what he wanted to be called, and we said okay. And um, that was fine. And when um, eventually, like, um, I got tired of using his dead name, like around family members and stuff. So I did ask him if it was okay if I just started using his name Adam on Facebook, and he did say yes. So I just one day switched it. I threw it out there and said, "Oh, Adam, want, he wants some awards." So we were proud. Of him. I was like, "Okay." Well, only a few people like private messaged me and said, "So it's Adam now." And I said, "Yes." And that's all I got. And then everybody was fine. Everybody at my job was so excited. They're like, "Oh my God, you have a son!" And I was like, "Yes, I have three sons. Thank you." So they were they were pretty cool. Some of the Older ladies, I didn't think were gonna be like okay with it, but I guess because they've known me for so long, they just kind of figured, oh well, this is a Christina thing, so it's fine. So everybody was really happy for Adam. Everyone's super supportive of him. Everybody loves him. And when it came to school, he did pretty much almost everything on his own. He talked to the teachers. He talked to his counselor. In fact, I had a teacher and a counselor call me and apologize for not for not seeing it you know, before he went to them, and it was okay. Um, everybody's been pretty cool, haven't had too many problems. Um, when Adam did come out, I didn't know um, any information. He had done all this research, I had nothing. So I uh, started to look through things on, online, and I found the Pride Center, and through the Pride Center, I found Trans Allies, which is super wonderful, super loving and wonderful, supportive people, and I, I'm so happy to have that because I had no idea what to do or where to go. And through them, we found doctors and just attorneys, anything we needed, psychiatrists. They have all the information we were looking for, and it just made this so much easier. We were able to get Adam statement gender marker changed, and um, when he started testosterone, you know, it was wonderful. We found a wonderful doctor, and you know, we even celebrated his day with a cake and everything. So it's just been, we've been really lucky. Very, very fortunate that we have all the support that we have from both sides of our family. So, I'll just What school district? East Central. So, Adam, let me ask you, how have you addressed school and how has it been, how has the experience been for you? And have you been anywhere lately? <laughs> um, well, first I'll answer the uh, last question. Um, yes, I have been uh, somewhere. I went to uh, Sydney, Australia to sing in the Opera House with an uh, international choir.
instead of being like how I usually was and calm and collective, I decided, hey, I'm going to try and explain it to him, which did not go well because he did not accept the information I gave to him. Um, I even went and explained the science behind it, but he said um, this statement, which angers me to this day. He said, if we pull our pants down right now, will we have the same genitalia? No. Then you're not a man. And I remember just being like, are you kidding me? I tried explaining this to you, but, and then I told my band director, and he, like, he told the kid the next day, like, hey, you shouldn't say that all this stuff. But um, then that I was hoping, oh, maybe that got something through him. No. Like, around Battle of Flowers, when we were doing practice for, um, our, no, it wasn't even on practice. It was the day of the night parade. Um, we were we were going home on the bus, and him and his friend kept repeatedly using the wrong name, the wrong pronouns, on purpose to annoy me. And I, I wouldn't respond to them or anything, not even look at them. But then sometimes they would talk behind my back and be like, "Oh yeah, you know, blank." Yeah, um, she, and I'm just like, are you kidding me? And so then I told the band director again, and I thought, um, okay, so I told the band director, and the band director told me to write a statement and everything, and then that um, there, something would happen, so I gave the statement to the band director, the band director looked over with the other one, and then they sent it to the administration. Nothing happened. The kids went unpunished. Um, they didn't even get a talk from the band directors, and that infuriated me. It made me so upset that nothing was done about it. Um, and part of me just thinks it's because of the, it's the end of the year and they don't want to deal with it, or they don't know how to, or m many things. But either way, the fact of the matter is they didn't do anything about it, and that's what frustrated me. But so far, that's the only bad experience I've had. Every other experience, in school, like, being trans has been great. My choir director, she was um, real supportive. She even let me wear, like, a tux and actually be in the men's choir and sing um, tenor with all the other guys. And I went to UIL singing um, tenor. And I actually, uh, because a lot of the kids failed, <laughs> I was the only tenor one that could sing like the really high note, so I got to sing that high note, and um, because my voice is so loud, you can actually hear it echo throughout the um, performing arts center, and that felt great, being on stage with other guys and singing with them, and not, like, it just felt so great and amazing, and then not only in choir was like I welcome, but in um, theater, my, my theater director actually let me change the other guys because the other guys were pretty cool about it. They were like, oh, whatever, it's fine. And he was just like, yeah, you can go in there. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah, it's fine. They're cool. And I'm like, okay. And I had no fear whatsoever because I knew most of those kids. And I felt really comfortable and it was, it was just awesome. And then in my other classes, like with my teachers, I remember the first day of school, I said, like, oh, it's Adam, because my name had not been legally changed yet. And the teachers had been supportive, and they called me by my name and the right pronouns. And actually, um, my, uh, yeah, Algebra 2 teacher, she, um, one time she had asked me to use the wrong pronoun. She's like, oh, I'm so sorry, my mistake. I'm, I meant he. And, like, it was just nice seeing, like, a teacher actually correct themselves and, like, try and make an effort, because with students, I haven't really gotten that, except for maybe like my friends. And, it sounds yeah. like Sounds like Northside might have some competition here in town. Uh, <laughs> like East Central has really done a good job. So, thank you very much, Adam. Hey, one last quick question for the moms. What are your hopes for schools? Especially in the coming year, we'll start with you, Christina. Um, for me, I just hope that schools get educated more than anything, because it's super frustrating 
having to go in as a parent and educate everybody, I I realized that this is pretty much new for most schools, but I feel like even when I've had a few roadblocks when I do present them with information and they just don't, they don't seem to want to change all the time. So I would like to see more change, more acceptance, and just more education in the schools. I want my son to go to the bathroom <laughs> and to not have to do pee. Um, I want schools to remember that they're there to support kids and not to like instill their personal um, biases on kids. And actually remember that they're there for the kids. Okay, can I amend that? I also want um, teachers to use their pronouns. So if I, I, I try to do this wherever I go, but my biggest thing is that if I can leave you with one thing tonight, if you could, in your signature line of your email, change your pronouns and uh, or add your signature, add your pronouns to your signature line. So right under your name, you would put pronouns dash whichever pronouns you identify with. And it's really easy to do, and it's really important for everyone to do it, especially as cisgender people, because we're the people who are going to make it normal for everybody to use their pronouns. So, please do that for me tonight. So, Amy, where is Amy? Give your pronouns and the signature on your email. Where's Brian? Here. You? Yes. Dr. Rankin? Are you going to consider it? Cool. So you've already made a difference in someone's life. Um, so I would like to ask the folks from Yes to Youth, Emmett, Brad, Alice, if you'll all come up here, please do mind, Alice. Um, so I want to move into a question and answer time and, a, and make this a conversation. Because what we're here for is to change people's lives. Dr. Ricky, I'm sorry, I thought I included you. I didn't want to be here. No, no, I, <laughs> um, and her name, her name is Laura Rinkin. It's just such a habit for me to call her Dr. Rinkin. Um, but she told me earlier she doesn't mind being called Laura. So, um, so are there questions? Do people have conversation or questions? So my question is, as uh, the custodial parent um, of gender non-conforming, non-binary children, how can, can I, I stop you? Yes. So this individual yes. just said, as a, as a non-custodial parent, as, as, a custodial as a custodial parent of gender non-conforming, non-binary, transgender children, those are all terms we use to describe a family, I'm not going to call them a group, but a, a, a family of identities of people whose um, gender is somehow different than the, the very binary gender they were identified with at birth. Um, how can I speak to the parents of their biological other parents? so that they can be more supportive in their journey. I think a lot of it depends on your relationship, obviously, with that other parent. Um, if you are successful co-parents, I think face-to-face, -face, sit down, and you might ask your child, you know, would you like to be present? Would you like to explain this to your mom or dad with me? Or would you like to write a letter? Some kids feel more comfortable that way, or you know, sending an email or something. Um, but that should maybe be the first conversation, because just because your child came out to you, they might not be ready to come out to their dad or their mom or their grandmother or you know, something like that. So that's a conversation you should have first. 
And I'm always a big proponent of face-to-face -face is always best because I feel, you know, telephone things can be get misconstrued. Uh, but definitely check with your, your child first before you make any steps in that direction. So I want to introduce you to someone else really quickly. His name is Adam Zosega. And Adam is, Adam, come up here. Adam, Adam is an LPC, and he sees a large number of the trans kids here, especially young ones, here in the city of San Antonio. And right before we started this evening, he was talking to me about that specifically. So I've invited him up here to take a quick swing at that, if you don't mind. Okay, sure. Yeah, I was talking to Lauren earlier about um, some of the most challenging work for me as a therapist um, is working with families um, where parents are divorced, right? Because if we have a child's parent who is affirming, um, and we have a child's parent who is unaffirming, especially when the divorce decree indicates that there's um, decisions that are being made by both parents, right? So it's not just one parent that can make decisions. Um, that's, that's really difficult, right? And I think oftentimes um, a therapeutic setting is gonna be helpful in those situations because it can allow for the therapist to hold space for both parents, right? And to talk about, for example, with the other affirming parent, to find out what those fears are, right? What are those challenges? And allow um, for the processing of feelings of grief, feelings of fear, um, and then providing resources, right, to that parent. Um, and hopefully they're also wanting to engage in counseling services as well, right? Always taking the lead of the child, right? And talking to them about what this could look like. Um, so I think that those are some important pieces. And I think uh, a therapeutic environment could be essential in helping uh, parents learn more about their child's experience and how they can be supportive and affirming of, of their experience. Do any of the parents have a comment? I do. Um, me and my, uh, our Adam's dad were divorced, and um, when Adam came out, I asked him, I said, do you want to tell your dad, or do you want me to do it? He wanted me to do it. I made a phone call. Um, I wasn't sure how he was going to go. He was OK. Um, he asked me why Adam didn't tell him, and I told him he wasn't ready. But um, I feel like he's, he's been OK. Uh, he's, maybe not as supportive as everybody else, but he does love his son and he is there for them, him. And um, I feel like, um, well, at least for us, the phone call was the way to go because I feel like if I would've did it face to face, there might've been confrontation. So I felt like it was easier. He was in his own home, he could sit down, you know, and, and I approached it. Um, I just told him, I have something to tell you. It's about, um, our son Adam, and he said, Adam, and I said, um, Adam's dead name, and he said, oh, okay, and, and when I explained everything, he, he was okay. So I really feel like it just depends on the relationship you have with your ex, or or whatever they might be to you. Um, for us, we're, we're okay, we're not best friends, but you know, we're okay. So that's what worked for us. One thing I would like to add is that, um, if you have a divorce decree, to make sure you know what's in that divorce decree. You don't want to put yourself in any kind of legal risk with that other person. Uh, if you don't have a good relationship, you know it's a very big risk because you don't know how they're going to react or what they might try to do. So just make sure you know what's in that document because that is a legal, legally binding document for you. One of the other things that I wanted to mention was that, um, so, so sometimes kiddos are comfortable with not coming out to an unaffirming parent. And oftentimes um, when somebody is looking to medically transition or legally transition in terms of official documentation with their name and gender marker, is where we see there to be challenges in my work with, with youth and with adolescents. So sometimes um, kiddos uh, won't reveal their, their asserted gender identity to their unaffirming parent until uh, a situation occurs where maybe they're wanting to pursue gender affirming hormone therapy or a legal name and gender marker change. Uh, I can also tell from my experience. 
experience having uh, my parents divorced by, and also being a couple hundred miles away from one of them. Uh, when I, like I said, my dad first found out that I was questioning my sexuality by on accident. You know, he wasn't meant to know. I wanted to keep this to myself because it also helped, it also so depends on the child, like, you know, the child's feelings. They may be not ready to come out to a parent, even if they know if their parent, you know, supportive and willing to accept them no matter what. Uh, so it really also all depends on, you know, the child's own feelings, if they're ready to come out, if they're ready to make steps and tell, if not just one parent who is affirming, and tell them, you know, even if both parents are affirming, the child may be uncomfortable. Uh, like for me, I was uncomfortable telling my dad that I was even questioning because I actually didn't know what, what his opinion on it, what his stance was, if he was going to be supportive or if he wasn't. And uh, my dad asked me when he first found out, you know, do you feel like a boy in a boy's body or do you feel like a girl trapped in a boy's body? Which to me was sort of the first, you know, idea that you know, it is a thing. Being trans is a real thing. Uh, feel saying that, but you know, being trans is a real thing. And uh, so, you know, with my dad's help, I actually managed to tell my mother, who I really didn't want to tell at the time, but kind of felt I had to. You know, so it all, like I said, it depends on the child's feelings of. But security and comfort, knowing that other people know that they're at least even considering that they may not be sustained. Other questions? Anyone else? Questions, comments?
you know, to let them know that, hey, I'm somebody you can talk to if you need to. But also kind of to piggyback off of what you said earlier, I think it's just really important that cisgender people kind of get on board with this. That we might not have children that are trans or nieces or nephews, grandkids, but I mean, even start in our own homes that, you know, my daughter's right there, she just turned three, and she is going into the stage of like, well, boys do this, and he can't be in here. And it's like, no, people can be wherever they, people are people, you know, they can go wherever they want to. I want to marry a girl when I grow up. That's great, I hope she treats you right. You know, that's just, and it shouldn't be that, you know, oh, well, I want to do, my son wants to do ballet, and my father said, well, no, you don't want to do that, that's girl stuff. And I'm like, yeah, we don't say that in our house. You know, and so starting those kind of conversations in the grocery store, at your home, it spreads. You know, the whole ripples in a pond kind of thing. And like, uh, I was going to speak to that as well, the language piece, especially if you were a teacher. If you can unpack gender out of your room, it's little stuff like the bathroom passes. The, a lot of teachers have lights, like push push button lights, or like a boy light and a girl light, and you push the girl light if you're a girl and they go to the bathroom. Take the girl off the light, just have a light. <laughs> Quick gliding kids up by boys light up here, girls light up here. It's little stuff and the kids notice it, and the safe space stickers and the triangles and the converse made a bunch of pride signs a couple years ago, and I put them out and I put them in my classroom, and they take pride. This big in the corner and the kids know it. <laughs> Texas has a training called TransSafe. And so um, I'm very proud to say that one of the signs um, Dr. Rinkin has in her office is a TransSafe sign that says that she is an ally to, to train and train to be a transgender ally um, by the Transgender Education Network of Texas. But I want to tell all the school districts in here that we would love to do that. Um, a principal recently in, in a school that we trained um, stopped me halfway through and said, so I'm changing today, I'm changing all of our, our name tags, I'm adding pronouns. And we're going to have conversations at every staff meeting about gendered activities in the classrooms. So schools can do this, schools can do it. Um, this week we are traveling to the valley and we will be training one of the larger school districts in the valley. We'll be training 150 um, teachers, administrators, and staff from um, a, a large school district. So it can be done. It's not just, it's just because people choose not to.
or the principal or the counselor that is. So she's now finding out um, what am I supposed to be prepared for the negative. And I know myself, I cannot, I will not hold myself back. I will defend like a female lion. Can, can I speak to that? Can I? Let me, let me get you okay. to me. So, there's only one person on our panel, I, I, I think, that can really address that from a sexuality perspective and live through it and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm gonna out him, but I've already outed him twice today. Um, and, but, but he lives pretty out and proud. So, um, Brad, do you, do you mind addressing that? Sexuality question? We, we talked about it. So we so yeah. Uh, yeah, you and I had this discussion about Sarah's earlier okay. a little bit. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, and your daughter's 13 right now, right? Mm -hmm, yes. uh, I think that it is a situation where, as a parent of a child who may be LG or B, uh, in some instances, you're just trying to, kids are just trying to figure it out. Um, and it just takes time, I think, to really step into what you feel is comfortable. And if you want to be super out about it, then you'll be super out about it. Some folks, I mean, Lauren says that I'm super out. Um, I wasn't always super out. When I was 13, I definitely wasn't super out. Um, I mean, I, I knew that I had, I knew that I was not reacting to girls in the same way as my brother and other people, other friends of mine were reacting. Um, but it took me until I was literally in college uh, before I finally was just like, okay, let's just let's just sit down and figure out what it is that is, feels different about me, um, and then just be honest about it to myself. And for me, I mean, it's a different situation because I didn't come out to my parents; I got outed to my parents. Um, so for me, it was a whole it was a much different situation than having affirming parents who were saying, uh, you know, I love you for who you are. Nothing you say is going to change that. I literally was told that I was going through a phase. Um, and that I would eventually grow out of it. Um, hadn't happened yet, so. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think it is, and for, for teenage kids especially, uh, be speaking to my own experience at least, uh, we're really just trying to figure it out, and at some point, you know, at some point we just get comfortable in our own skin enough to actually step up and say, this is how, this is who I am. But, but what I mean, like, in school, like, in, uh, she just, she told me earlier, she told me she wants to check her assistant principal first before anybody else that she can play. But then I'm thinking, what would her reaction be to her? Wait a minute. I don't know. She wants me to be there, but I'm kind of like worried about that. So I, I've noticed that when I talk to my school, um, what my son's school about this, that um, the more confident I was about supporting him, the better this reception is from anyone else in, in the community, at the school, or anything else, because nobody wants to wake the mama bear, right? right. So I think that when you, when you, if you want to talk to the school about it, um, if you go in in a confident, supportive, kind, and looking at it from an educational standpoint, if they have any questions, that you come to them and say, I want to be your ally and to support and keep my daughter safe. Um, and we wanted to let you know that this is going on so that you can be aware of the safety issue that's possible. And then give the school the opportunity to work with you on that. It's, I think it always starts from a good place when you start it off well like that, instead of coming back at it in a negative way. But I, I, I'm just speaking as a parent who's worked with a school on that, so that's that's the extent of my knowledge on that. Uh, so speaking as a bi person, um, I'm openly bi, uh, and I do LGBTQ work. Um, so first of all, congratulations. It is so hard to come out as being bi. Oh, and my name is Andrea, I use she her pronouns. I do field and policy for tent. Um, but um, it's really difficult, and so I just want to take a moment to say, like, I'm so proud of you as another bi person. Um, rock on. Second of all, um, 
I think that going in with your child to go talk about it is great. I would say uh, to your daughter, write a letter. It's so much easier to convey what you're thinking, what you're feeling in a letter, um, and just say it out loud. Um, no one can take your voice away. Um, but you're also at a great age where you can start a GSA. There are other people, I am sure of it, that are gay, lesbian, and bi that are feeling the same exact way that you are, um, and you're not alone. Okay? Like, you're not. Uh, in your school, in your school district, um, in this city, you are not alone. Um, do you mind asking me what uh, or what school district you're in? Okay. Um, yeah, so I think, because uh, I am a someone who wants to do something, um, have the conversation, and um, if it's too much, maybe it's just your mom, and that's okay. Um, but then go and say, I really, if you're up to it, start a GSA, because you're gonna be that. You're gonna create your own group. You're gonna create your own community, and that is so important. Um, but also find community here. Um, I can give you, you know, other teachers who started GSAs. I'm from Edgewood. Edgewood is a very uh, complicated school district, um, but they started GSAs. And when I went there, I thought that would never happen. Um, so find that opportunity. Um, find maybe a teacher who you feel comfortable with um, and having that conversation, and maybe they will be the sponsor to that school program. Um, the goal is to find an ally. It is always to find an ally, but protect yourself. Um, it is hard to be by, let me tell you. <laughs> it is very difficult, but don't let anybody say that you need to choose something or you need to pick or make a decision already, and it is not a phase. This is your life, and that's okay. Um, and I support you 100%. <laughs> I'm right behind you. Um, yeah. <laughs> So we have, we have gone over time already. We're about 15 or 20 minutes over. Um, so I want to thank all of you for coming. And um, if you have pressing questions, I can't speak for everyone, but my experience has been that we all stay around for at least a few minutes. If you want to speak to any of us one-on-one, -on -one, we'll answer any questions you have. Thank you very much.